In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. (laughs) The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday of Easter is from Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, Can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked. And behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord, when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The epistle is from 1 John chapter 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that day, The first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I wonder what it would have been like to, to be there. Would you have been filled with joy, or would you have been filled with terror? To be there with the prophet Ezekiel. The Lord leads him down into a valley full of dead, dry bones. Emphasis on the dry. You know, your bones are filled with marrow. They are not dry because you are alive. But these bones, deep down in the valley, are not just dead. They're very dead. Emphasis on the dry. And so the Lord asks the prophet, can these bones live? (laughs) And what does he say? Well, Lord, you know because he's not so Sure. And so the Lord tells him to prophesy to the bones. Prophesy to the bones, son of man, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. The Lord tells him to say that he will cause breath to enter them, that the bones would stand, that sinews and and tendons would cover them. And then after being told what to say to those dead, dry bones, the prophet Ezekiel does what any good prophet is supposed to do. He speaks the very words that the Lord has given him. He says exactly what the Lord says he should say, and what happens is exactly what the Lord said would happen. The bones are put together. Bone to bone with sinews and and tendons covering them. And what a scene that would have been. Would you have been filled with joy? Or would you have been terrified? The bones coming up and being put together by the prophet's speaking. Now, catch this. The bones that have been put together are not yet alive. There is more to be said. There is more life to be given. Think back to Adam. When the Lord God took him up out of the dust of the earth and put him together in the creation, and yet Adam was not yet a living creature until the Lord breathed the breath of life into Adam. Yes, there were bones And there was flesh, and there was blood. But until the breath of life had been breathed into Adam, Adam was not yet a living, breathing human. That flesh needed the breath of life. And so do these now put together bones. The bones by themselves are not yet fully living. So the Lord tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath, which is kind of weird. Because it's not just any breath he's prophesying to. He's literally prophesying to the Spirit of God. That's the breath that comes. That's the breath that was going over the bones. The breath and the Spirit are one. It's the same word in Hebrew, ruach, the breath and the spirit. So that when Ezekiel prophesies, when he speaks the word, the word then brings the spirit. Can you see it? The word that the prophet speaks brings the Spirit of God. And the word that he speaks then causes that Spirit of God, the very breath of life, to go into those bones. And now, flesh 
and blood and breath of life together, those bones stand and are living. An exceedingly vast army, which the Lord Himself says are the whole people of Israel. Now, I wonder what Ezekiel would do with that question the next time he would be asked it. I mean, Ezekiel the prophet would indeed witness future death. What about those bones? When those bones would die? The people of Israel perishing in future generations. I wonder what Ezekiel would do the next time some child of Israel would come to him and say, Ezekiel, tell us, can those bones live? Well, the Lord makes sure he isn't in doubt. Did you catch it at the end of the reading? Thus says the Lord God, I will open your graves and will raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. So what do you think? I mean, he really was led through that valley. He really did see the dead, dry bones. He really did prophesy twice as the Lord commanded him and see those bones brought together a living army of people. How do you think he answered the question the next time? Can these bones live? Okay. Now fast forward to Easter evening. The disciples aren't being led down into a valley of dead, dry bones, but they certainly have seen dead bones. At least John was still there to witness the death of Jesus. Of course, the others, like sheep, had gone astray and had fled out of fear and trembling. But there they are now, locked together, having witnessed the death of the one they followed. The one in whom they had put their trust. Like Ezekiel, the disciples aren't so sure. No, in fact, they disbelieve. They do not believe that the Jesus they saw crucified on Friday can indeed live. In fact, Luke 24, which is a, an Easter account that we don't get in the one-year lectionary, tells us that when Jesus is walking on the road to Emmaus, the disciples that he, he goes and stands with on Easter day tell him that it's because he died that they know he could no longer be the one to redeem all of Israel. What? Wasn't it his death by which he did redeem all of Israel? And hadn't he told his own disciples three separate times that he would go into Jerusalem and be handed over and be crucified and on the third day rise from the dead? And yet, when he had done just that, and when they should have been waiting in great expectation for those bones to rise again, they have no hope. They're despairing. They do not believe that Jesus will live again. And they're his closest disciples. Now, what do you do when the man you have followed for three years promised to be faithful to 
I've been told that you will continue his own ministry and then, de- and, and, and then despaired of him and thought that he couldn't actually now be that guy. What do you do when that guy is actually risen from the dead and standing right in front of you? Are you filled with joy? Or do you cower in fear? I should have believed. I should have trusted His Word. I should have known better. He had told us exactly what He would, what he would do, and yet there we were despairing like a bunch of people with no hope. And now He's standing in front of us? Oh. He had every right to come in anger. And what does he say to those fearful, cowering, despairing disciples who had failed to believe the resurrection? Shalom. Shalom. He says, peace. Peace be with you. Not wrath, not judgment, not I'm coming against you, not how could you have been so stupid, not why didn't you believe. No, just just peace. A holy absolution to soothe the despairing, fearful conscience. And then he repeats himself. And says, receive the Holy Spirit, that by that Spirit you might believe my words. Receive the Holy Spirit. As the Father has sent me to forgive you, so now I am sending you. So that whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And whoever sins you do not forgive because they do not confess and do not repent, those sins likewise are not forgiven. Now, I wonder how the disciples answered the question the second time. Well, we know what they did with Thomas, right? They went and they told him what they had seen, that Jesus was raised from the dead. But even more than that, 20, 30 years later, all of those disciples would die for their conviction that the bones really live. All the disciples, except for John, who was exiled on the island of Patmos, all the other disciples would perish for that conviction. Because you could not convince them that it didn't happen. Nor could you convince them that it wouldn't happen for them. So, Peter is crucified upside down because he would not renounce that conviction. That Jesus is Lord. That the risen Christ really did rise. And guess what? That his own bones would also live. So you know how it worked for the martyrs? Like there's a record of the martyrs, the early martyrs who were persecuted and, and, and told, we heard about this over the weekend at the marriage and family conference. They were told to just give a little pinch of incense to Caesar and we'll let you live. And Polycarp, he says, go ahead and take my head. The Lord Jesus will give me a new one. Because they were really convinced. The bones can live. I don't remember when it was. I don't remember the exact month. But last year when the uh, 
Indian paintbrushes began to bloom. They were, they were everywhere, right? And my family and I, we had been in Sedalia, and I got a text, and they said, hey, you need to stop by Trinity Cemetery because the Indi- Indian paintbrushes are just, just everywhere. So we did. We came back, and we, we went, and, and we looked at the flowers. But we looked at the flowers in the cemetery with five kids. And there we were walking among the bones. Dead. Dry bones. Some more dry than others. There were fresh graves over which I had officiated the committal. And there they were, just weeks before. There were old graves. Some of your own ancestors with grass growing over them. You could hardly read the, the headstone. But there we are, walking in the cemetery. <laughs> Can those bones live? Of course, my kids are curious and have questions in the cemetery. Can those bones live? How do you answer the question? Or how do you answer the question when you're walking through the living cemetery of this world and you see, you see the walking dead of our culture who do not live spiritually, right? They haven't had the Spirit of God come into them to make them living people. No, their bodies are walking, but their spirits are what? Dead. Can those bones live? Can faith still be given to this culture that rejects truth? And is there more to the Christian hope than simply dying and being in heaven? Now don't get me wrong. Paul says in Philippians that it is far better for me to die and be with Christ, right? But what about the body? I mean, we teach, and we teach, and we teach year after year after year to our confirmands and to our adult confirmation, uh, those who will be confirmed next Sunday. We teach that in death, the body and the spirit are rent apart, right? What God joined together when he makes us, when he made Adam, when he made the bones, body and soul together in death is torn apart. That's why we grieve. The body who God the Father created. The body which God the Son redeemed. The body which God the Holy Spirit made to be His own temple is no longer living and breathing. The body perishes. That's why Jesus died when His friend Lazarus, why Jesus cried when His friend Lazarus was dead. It's why the Father sent His Son so that you who believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. And eternal life is not just a floaty, spiritual, cloudy existence. No, you're a person. Like Jesus was a person, a body and a soul put together as a whole. You are not complete when body and soul have been torn apart. Now science, science can't convince you that that's true. They can't go into a lab and and recreate the resurrection. Yes, there are near-death experiences. And you you might see a movie every time that talks about someone who was close to dying and then comes back and they have these tales to tell. Well, what about the Scriptures? Why don't we believe them? They're there all the time to trust and to know. We have to take a a, a little boy's word who is in shock and filled with medication and has visions. We have something more trustworthy. The prophetic word of God to which we do well to pay attention. We have something even more trustworthy. The death and resurrection of Jesus which last week we heard is the first fruits of those who believe in Him. 
We have Ezekiel 37 in the valley of the dry bones where the bones are put back together again and act as a picture then of the whole people of God. We have Jesus who was dead but now lives never to die again. So you may stumble when someone asks you the question the first time, can these bones live? But our readings today serve to strengthen you by the very Spirit of God so that when the question is put to you the second time, you would not hesitate but would boldly confess that I know not only that my Redeemer lives, but that in the end we shall stand upon this earth and even after my flesh has been destroyed, yet in my same body, although glorified, I will see Jesus. With eyes that are recreated. In a body that is raised undiable, imperishable, that was sown in dishonor but raised in glory, that was sown in in weakness but is raised in power, like Jesus. Philippians 2, right? Our citizenship is in heaven, from which we await a Savior Christ the Lord, who will raise our lowly bodies, so that they will be like His glorious body by the power that enables him to subdue all things to himself. Can these bones live? Can your bones live? Can the bones of the people of the world not yet believing be made to live? Oh, Lord, you know. (laughs) But by the word of God today, now, you know too. And it makes all the difference. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Amen. The service continues as we confess the Christian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, You delivered us from our bondage to the devil when you made us your children in holy baptism. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, 
that we would be sustained in the faith that overcomes the world so that our lips would never cease confessing with St. Thomas that your Son, Jesus, is our Lord and our God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, your Son breathed on his disciples and gave them the Holy Spirit, thus ordaining them into the office of the Holy Ministry, that repentance and the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name throughout the world. Continue to raise up for us faithful men to serve in this apostolic ministry and bless their service among your people. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, you have gathered us together into the fellowship of this congregation of saints. Bless us with hearts and minds that long for the pure spiritual milk of your word. And let us never tire of supporting the gracious work you do among us here. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, remember your children who have wandered from the household of faith. Faithful to your promises, work all things in their lives to remind them of their need for your unending grace and steadfast love, that they might return to the faith and rejoice in your Son who has died and has risen from, for them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, you appoint rulers and officials for the sake of order and peace. Bless those whom you have placed in authority over us at the federal, state, and local levels. Give to them the desire to serve with integrity and honor and to work for the benefit of all, Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, look with mercy upon all who suffer in this veil of tears, especially Dorothy, Delbert, Beverly, Larry, David, Rudy, Denise, Barb, Chelsea, and Joanne. Provide them with loving and compassionate care and comfort them with the with the reminder that everyone who has been born of God and overcomes the world, and that believing that Jesus is the Christ, they have life in his name. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death. And by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, oh Hosanna, oh Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. For you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me.
In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Let's do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Lamb of God, you take away the body of Christ and forgiveness of all your sins. body of Christ for the forgiveness of all your sins. The body of Christ for the forgiveness of all your sins.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
convention this weekend here that was held at Trinity Lutheran Church was quite a success. I think we had somewhere between 150 and 200 people attended, so it was well, well attended. I would also like to uh, take this time to invite everybody to the Easter Cantata, which is this evening at 5 o'clock. Um, it's very, very moving, uh, very moving music that I think that you will really enjoy. So thank you and have a great day. And we hope to see you down by the class. Thank you.